with two oil pipeline projects proposed for BC. This is an opportune time to reflect on Canada's energy policy and whether heavy oil pipelines and tanker traffic along BC's coast are in our public interest. This question is complex, but my experience is that when thoughtful people are provided good and full information, they make sound decisions. Unfortunately, when it comes to oil sands extraction and export, we are given only part of the story. We are given the picture the industry wants us to see. Like Enbridge's missing islands in the Douglas Channel, we are given a false narrative about the risks and the costs. This is how the Douglas Channel was presented in the Enbridge Northern Gateway promotional video. This slide shows us what Enbridge left out. We, as Canadians, are being asked to invest our cultural, social, economic and environmental capital by granting a public license for these projects. Our government has failed us by cooperating with industry to present a strategy that benefits very few. By taking Big Oil's business case and evaluating it from the perspective of the public interest, something our government should have done for us, I'm going to fill in missing pieces in the oil extraction and export picture and why Big Oil wants these pipelines. Canada's energy strategy is determined in the boardrooms of a handful of corporations and by the governments of foreign countries through their state-owned oil companies. The strategy is communicated to our government through closed-door meetings with lobbyists and at state dinners over dessert in foreign countries. Multinational interests consistently exaggerate the benefits, deny the costs, and underplay the environmental risk. Since our needs and concerns are inconvenient, we are viewed with contempt. Five multinational oil companies control 78% of oil sands production. These companies are Suncor, Imperial Oil, Shell, Canadian Natural Resources, and Synovus. Even though some have head offices in Calgary, they are multinationals and respond to interests that are not necessarily compatible with ours. For example, Suncor owns a refinery in Colorado, operates retail outlets in the U.S., and owns oil assets in Libya and Syria. Synovus, in partnership with ConocoPhillips, jointly owns refineries in the U.S. Imperial and Shell are foreign-owned. Canadian Natural Resources has offshore drilling in the North Sea and West Africa. The other oil companies with extensive oil sands interests are relatively new actors, not yet producing large volumes, and are primarily state-owned. National oil companies like Norway's Stat Oil and China's Sinopec, PetroChina, and the Chinese national offshore oil company, Sinook, which now owns Nexen. These companies bought significant oil sands rights over the past eight to ten years. They plan on playing a significant role. What is Big Oil's plan? They want to rapidly extract oil sands heavy crude, mix it with imported diluent to allow it to flow through pipelines, and export it as diluted bitumen to the U.S. Gulf Coast, Asia, and India. To do this, they tell us they need export pipelines like Keystone XL, Northern Gateway, Trans Mountains Twin, and Canada East. This wasn't always the plan. As recently as 2008, Alberta's multinational oil producers were going to invest in upgrading and refining in Canada. They planned to ensure the oil sector grew along with the extraction of resources. These projects would have taken Alberta's already strong downstream activity up a notch stabilized the industry, and securely established a domestic value-added supply chain. When running for re-election in 2008, Prime Minister Harper promised bitumen would not be exported to Asia, but would be upgraded to synthetic crude oil. He promised this because upgrading means value-added wealth, meaningful jobs, and control over environmental standards. His government continued to publicly support upgrading in Canada right up until Enbridge filed its application for Northern Gateway. But Harper's promises did not concern big oil. Exporting raw bitumen is not good for Alberta's value added, and it's not good for the environment. 
It's only good for a handful of very large companies. These companies got their way. The negative economic implications of a strategy based on rapid extraction and export of bitumen are staggering. But today, you won't hear anything about the economic costs from ministers of the Government of Canada, who instead of protecting the public interest, have become marketing executives for big oil. Our elected officials work with industry to create fear in uninformed Canadians that if we don't hurry up and approve these bitumen export pipelines, economic opportunities will be lost. They try to avoid transparency and accountability by setting up a false dichotomy. They pretend Canadians are faced with a difficult choice between economic gain versus environmental harm. This is not the trade-off we face, and yet the federal government spends millions trying to convince us it is. Heavy crude oil pipelines are not a competition between economic gain versus environmental, cultural, and social cost. This is a fabricated trade-off developed by oil interests to pit ordinary Canadians against ordinary Canadians. They hope our fear of economic loss if we don't approve heavy oil pipelines is greater than our fear of environmental harm if we do. The real picture is bitumen export will bring significant environmental harm and economic harm. When it comes to non-renewable resources, rapid extraction and export is exploitation, not economic development. Development means enhancement, value added, improvement, some form of contributing to a better state because of economic activity. There are essentially two things to do with bitumen once it comes out of the ground. The first option is to upgrade bitumen to synthetic crude oil called SCO, so it can be refined to become petroleum products like gasoline and jet fuel. This option is the value chain that benefits Canada and our economy, as illustrated by this slide. The second option, the one the whole oil sector is pursuing with the Harper and Alberta government's active support, is dilute bitumen with a substance, like condensate, to move it down a pipeline for upgrading and refining in foreign markets. Exploitation is not development. Exploitation will deliver a worsened economic, social, environmental and cultural reality to BC, Alberta and the rest of Canada. It will entrench the negative economic and environmental consequences that exist in a petrostate. If you extract and export bitumen diluted with condensate, only 35% of the value of our resources is captured within our economy. The rest of the value is shipped down the pipeline along with the jobs and environmental standards, along with the wealth and government revenue. Upgrading bitumen captures 70% of the value of our oil sands heavy crude, while refining it to end user products captures 100% of the value in our economy. Now we've all been told the story that it's not economic to build upgraders or refineries in Canada. We are led to believe that if it were, then big oil would be doing it. What we aren't told is that a number of upgraders and refineries were planned for Alberta right up to the financial crisis in 2008. What we aren't told is that the U.S. heavily subsidizes its refineries, allowing them to invest in facilities that can handle bitumen and add value in the U.S. What we aren't told is that under the 1975 Energy Policy and Export Act, the U.S. protects its energy value added by restricting the export of its crude oil. Can you imagine how strong Canada's oil resource sector would be under a similar policy? What we aren't told is that labor and environmental standards in Asia are significantly lower than in Canada, and big oil can avoid those costs by shipping diluted bitumen there. And what does big oil strategy mean for petroleum product prices in Canada? For almost two years, Enbridge told us the benefits from Northern Gateway would come from higher prices paid in Asia for our oil. Pipeline apologists, like Minister of Natural Resources Joe Oliver, told us this contributes economic benefits to Canada. 
what they didn't tell us, and what my evidence filed with the National Energy Board disclosed was that they plan to charge those higher prices on every barrel produced and sold in Canada every year for not one year or five years, but every year for 30 years. When refineries pay higher prices for their feedstock, they shut down or they pass these prices on. So whenever you are told access to foreign markets secures higher prices for our raw crude and this benefits Canada, you also need to know oil producers plan to charge those higher prices on every barrel they produce. The market access Canadians need for Western Canadian crude is in Eastern Canada. That's a demand of about 750,000 barrels a day. Quebec and the Atlantic provinces are almost completely dependent on foreign crude oil imports. The same markets we are told China is trying to protect itself from by importing our crude. Refineries in Eastern Canada pay higher prices for their imports because they are priced off an international benchmark called Brent. But most Canadian refineries, especially in the East, cannot process oil sands bitumen. This means it needs to be upgraded in Alberta to, synth to synthetic crude oil into SCO if it is going to be used by Eastern refiners like Suncor, Imperial Oil, Valero, or Irving. None of the proposals for pipelines eastward guarantee Western Canadian oil will go into Eastern Canadian refineries to displace foreign imports. Unless Canadian energy self-sufficiency is a stated government policy and bitumen is upgraded in Alberta first, big oil's plans will cannibalize our economy. Traditionally, Alberta upgraded about 60% of the bitumen pulled out of the ground. In 2007, the Alberta government promised the rate would rise to 72%, bringing with it value-added, meaningful jobs and greater tax revenue. Then came the financial crisis and the upgrading projects were scrapped in Canada. In the U.S., investments in upgrading and refining were made including investments made by oil producers operating in Canada, such as Synovus, Husky, and French multinational Total. These investments were made to accept Canada's bitumen. So instead of a Canadian upgrader, we get Keystone XL, a bitumen export pipeline to the United States. As this graph explains, investment in U.S. refineries to accept our bitumen and the plan to do the same in Asia is hollowing out Alberta's resource sector. The percentage of bitumen upgraded in Alberta has begun to decline. In 2017, Alberta will only upgrade 48% of the bitumen it produces. And by 2025, it will be less than 40%. That's a long way away from where we would have been when Alberta promised 72% of the bitumen would be upgraded in Alberta by 2016. Because bitumen is so dense, like tar or wet cement, in order for it to flow down a pipeline, it requires diluent, like condensate. Condensate is a high-quality oil byproduct from natural gas and shale oil. Until 2005, Canada was self-sufficient in condensate production. When we produced a barrel of bitumen and mixed it with domestically produced condensate to make diluted bitumen, we exported a barrel of dil diluted bitumen. Not true anymore. By 2006, condensate demand began exceeding domestic supply. Oil sands producers started importing it from the U.S. The rapid extraction and export of bitumen, the cannibalization strategy, requires an unnecessary and growing import dependency on condensate. This is a part of the picture the industry never talks about. To import condensate, you need pipelines. That's why Enbridge reversed its Line 13 oil export pipeline in 2010 and built an extension in the U.S. They call it Southern Lights, and although it could export oil, it's importing condensate. Kinder Morgan recently received approval to reverse its Cochin pipeline so it can import condensate from Illinois in the U.S. to Alberta. More import pipelines is why the Enbridge Northern Gateway project includes a twin, one pipeline dedicated to import condensate, primarily from the Middle East. But the untold real clincher with big oil strategy is if a growing reliance on imports from the Middle East is not enough, in order to export diluted bitumen, 
instead of upgrading it in Alberta, more than twice the pipelines are required. You need a pipeline to bring condensate in, and when you mix it with bitumen at a ratio of 30% condensate to 70% bitumen, you need another pipeline to export diluted bitumen back out. Enbridge's Northern Gateway is intended to export 525,000 barrels a day of crude oil and import 193,000 barrels a day of condensate. The exploitation strategy requires twice the pipelines and 50% more tankers. The tanker that brings condensate to Kitimat does not leave with heavy oil. Northern Gateway's twin pipelines trigger an average of 220 Aframax, Suez Max, and very large crude carriers. 440 transits a year in the Douglas Channel and Hecate Strait. As this slide shows, these are very large vessels. Even the Aframax, that now docks at Trans Mountain's Burnaby Terminal, is taller than the Shangri-La, Vancouver's tallest building. The capacity of Northern Gateway's throughput and the tanker traffic it triggers is pretty common knowledge. What is not commonly appreciated is that Northern Gateway has been designed to ship 60% more crude oil and 40% more condensate by simply adding pumping power. The super tankers? Well, it's not 440 transits a year, it's 680. Almost two super tanker transits a day in BC's northern coastal waters. More crude, more condensate, more tankers, more risk. Way more risk. Spill risk is not additive. If there are 60% more oil tankers, there is more than a 60% increase in the risk of an oil spill. The expanded capacity risk was not considered by the National Energy Board in its review of Northern Gateway, but capital expenditures to expand capacity were in the project's budget. Once Northern Gateway is approved, which the federal government has led us to believe it will be, the oil industry is counting on less scrutiny and rapid approval to expand Northern Gateway. Kinder Morgan understands the benefits of this streamlined regulatory process. It relied on it to expand Trans Mountain's capacity about seven years ago. Until 2005, Trans Mountain's capacity was 225,000 barrels a day. In 2005 and 2006, Kinder Morgan applied for expanded capacity to 300,000 barrels a day under an expedited process. A growth in oil tanker traffic in Burrard Inlet was triggered. The number of oil tankers through English Bay has increased threefold since Kinder Morgan expanded Trans Mountain's capacity. At no time has an adequate terrestrial and marine environmental assessment been conducted on this increased volume, nor has the unique risk presented by diluted bitumen been assessed. Spill costs have not been calculated and adequate financial resources to pay for a spill are not assured. BC's five requirements for considering heavy oil pipelines were applied to the existing Trans Mountain Pipeline, the transport of diluted bitumen would be stopped. Kinder Morgan plans to twin Trans Mountain. They have told us their new pipeline will ship 540,000 barrels a day of diluted bitumen, triggering 408 tankers a year. This proposed new pipeline is 36 inches in diameter, the same diameter as Northern Gateway's oil pipeline. It is possible that the proposed Trans Mountain Twin is designed with much greater throughput capacity than what we are being led to believe. If Kinder Morgan's new pipeline can move up to 850,000 barrels a day as Northern Gateway can, this would mean the lower mainland system would accommodate over 1.2 million barrels a day of crude oil. That volume would mean either more supertankers or bigger supertankers or both. In 2011, Kinder Morgan said it planned to dredge Burrard Inlet to accommodate Suez Max supertankers. Suez, Suez Max ship about 25% more oil than Aframax because they are bigger. Kinder Morgan has said they abandoned that scenario, but it doesn't mean they won't bring it back. To fully understand the real risks of these pipeline projects, we need to know their designed capacity, not just the capacity the industry wants us to see. The top 10 economic costs of oil pipelines and supertankers are 
Number one, decades of higher oil prices for Canadian consumers and businesses across the country. Number two, lost opportunity to add value, create meaningful jobs, and control environmental standards here at home. Number three, hollowing out of the oil sector as raw bitumen exports take precedence over domestic upgrading and refining. Number four, continued reliance on foreign oil imports through Eastern Canada. Number five, an unnecessary and growing dependence on foreign condensate imports through Western Canada. Number six, crowding out of BC's legitimate and vibrant economic activity. Number seven, twice the number of pipelines and 50% more tanker traffic to move diluted bitumen as compared to upgraded bitumen. Number eight, more than twice the environmental risk and related costs. Number nine, as soon as Northern Gateway and Trans Mountain are approved, more pipeline capacity will be demanded without appropriate environmental assessment. And number 10, supernatural British Columbia becomes a super tanker terminal for Alberta. Big Oil's rapid extraction and export strategy is not a development strategy. It is an exploitation strategy that weakens Canada's oil sector and hollows out our economy. It makes no economic sense for Canadians. It only makes business sense for a handful of companies and their shareholders. We need to develop an energy policy in Canada, made in Canada, for and by Canadians. This is not what big oil wants, but it is what our country needs.